And we are age 16 now. You find Nami Nami in the lounge, flanked by two hollow screens and dueling a sketchbook with real paper. Uh, one hollow screen is playing an animated kid show, while the other is a wall of text that looks like it might be a translation guide of some kind. Nami's attention moves between the three easily. When they see you, they jump and quickly close their hollow screens, sitting up straight and clutching their sketchbook to their chest. Oh, hi, Selene, they giggle, rubbing the back of their head charmingly. How you doing? You can watch cartoons here. Nami relaxes a little, breathing an exaggerated sigh of relief. Good, because I really like cartoons. Nami sets their sketchbook aside and looks around a uh, conspiracy. Yeah. Thought you were going to bust me for jailbreaking my holopad, they say. All the Helio kids have restrictions on what we can watch and how long, but you guys have so many more cartoons than we had. Nami throws their arm in the air. Like the first season of Turbo Go Hyperjack Transfer? What? Nami shrugs and wiggles their finger. It was just like modding my game gauntlets, they reply. Sure, it's a little bit more complicated because, oh my gosh, no offense, but your hollow palm interface is so depreciated. But a lot of the fundamentals are the same. Nami closes their eyes and tips their head to the side, smiling. You know, you got a hollow pad genius here, too. They say, this was a mondo helpful in helping me figure out your old system. Wait, like, our dis? Nami nods, blinking innocently. Yeah, he's a total sweetheart, don't you think? Anyway, the important thing is I get to watch every episode of Turbo Girl Hypojet transform. Nami continues clapping their hands against their cheeks. It's the best cartoon ever made. What else has schoolgirls who look like aircraft from the waist down battling evil aliens while dealing with the stresses of high school life? Helio Media Archive only has season two through nine and only three of the OVAs, Nami says, puffing their cheeks out. I can't believe the fourth OVA, Flight Captain Yumihiro gets captured by the aliens and brainwashed into thinking she's been an alien sleeper agent the whole time. Uh, first season. Nami shrugs and pokes one finger into their cheek. Spaceships kids make stew. You don't have to know everything about something you like in order to call yourself a fan, Nami continues. Just liking it with all your heart is good enough. Nami laughs and flips over their sketchbook, showing you some of their drawings. I was drawing some fan art for the show, they say. Well, it's kind of fan art. Okay, it's really more like if I was a character in Hyper Girl Turbo tra Jet Transform. Aircraft. Nami blinks at you, clearly stunned your interest. Oh, uh, um. Well, okay, kind of. You see, all the cool aircraft are already taken, and it's rude to be a double. They press the tips of their index fingers together and look thoughtful. Sometimes I draw myself, I mean, my character is something weird, like a hot air balloon. But then I, um, I think it'd be cool if I was only regular human in Turbo Girl Hyperjets. You're heading back to the quarters at the end of the day, and as you pass by the med bay, you hear shouts and scrambling from within. Several surveyors have come back with serious wounds, not the usual broken limbs and sunstroke. One of them is holding a towel to her own leg. Staunching blood flow from a massive animal bite. Another looks nearly blinded from acid. Looks like chaos in there. Help in Med Bay. Need biology 50 or higher. Gosh, it's a good thing you were here. Triaging and getting the most badly wounded into the Med Bays is difficult, and the others need traditional medical attention while they wait. It's hectic, stressful work. Be able to keep your head and provide assistance. Good work in there, Selene, Chief Engineer Instance says. You know, with how the colony's grown, I could use an assistant nurse here. Someone I could trust to take care of things while I'm working the lab. Come back next month and give me a hand if you're interested. Unlocked nursing assistant in engineering. The sun rises again after the glow, heralding New Year. It's your 16th birthday. You wake in your new quarters, blinking into the watery sunlight. Dust motes float through the air you take a moment to enjoy the perfection of your bed while you listen to the sounds of the colony waking up outside. So much has happened in one year. Just a few short months ago, you thought your life was over. Now it's better than ever. I don't think it quite is. Mom's still gone. There's plenty of food and the colony is safe. You have your own bedroom. You're considering snoozing until your dad wakes up when the reveries... Your reverie is interrupted by... It's a text from Tanj. Joy's observance of the anniversary of your birth, it reads. Aw, she finally cares. Another one comes in. That means happy birthday, of course. And then, in case you didn't know. Wow, a whole three messages in a row from Tangent. That's pretty gushy for her. Scrolling through your other messages, you see some gossip about Cal and Tammy. 
Apparently, they're dating now? Whoa, you check your relationship status on the profiles. And yep, both of them have changed too. In a relationship. Your dad wakes up shortly after that and orders up a traditional birthday breakfast feast. He gives you a big squeezy hug and tells you he's proud of you. Ten Tanj gestures towards the geoponics zone. We're doing something really incredible things with genetically modified crops, she says. Proudly. Your combat DNA is fascinating. We can take the genes that select hardiness for tumia plants and insert them into the genome of humble Terran plants with higher yields, such as potatoes. Oh, she says, closing her eyes. Or even coffee beans. You've been noticing that things in, in general have not been acting as they should. Doors aren't opening, some rooms are super cold, and the holonet crashed while you were in the middle of playing Laser Fable with Nami Nami. There must be something going wrong with the ship mechanics. You pull up the incident log to see if you can determine a pattern, but it's empty. Suspiciously empty. Like it's been scrubbed. You act congruence to pull up just the temper the temperature log for the canteen, and she doesn't respond right away. I have been experiencing some fatal errors in my code, she says eventually, her holler projected face flickers, flickers giving the impression of pain. I'm able to partition off the effective areas, but it's impacting my ability to keep up with day-to-day -day management of the colony. I haven't wanted to worry the council, but I need your help. Engineer Hal was responsible for ongoing development, but after his death, well, there's limits to what any artificial intelligence... Heal her. Heal thyself, she quotes. Hal's documentation is impeccable, Congruent says proudly. He's written down all the directives to follow in, the exact, in case of this exact scenario. You'll be able to access my deepest code and follow his instructions to fragment the affected memory sectors. I know it sounds daunting, but I believe in you. You can do this. Engineering is way better than organizing, so we'll start by following instructions, I think. You do your best following Hal's instructions to the letter. Something's wrong, though. Hal's documentation is as detailed as Congruent says, but it feels like everything you try is just glancing off the real problem. It must be something even Hal couldn't have anticipated. He fragmented infected data banks and reroute her logic circuits around the bad memory seggers. You cross your fingers and reboot her. Lights go out, the fans turn off. You never heard a silence so complete aboard the ship. Then she boots back up. Ah, Congruence exclaims. I feel so refreshed and new again. I haven't felt this way since I was activated on board the stratosphere. She goes quiet and checks all her resources. Hmm, there's a bunch of extra space here now. As if I've forgotten something, but the important things are still there. Thank you for your assistance, Elaine. You aren't sure what caused the problem, but you fixed it, and you're here to fix it again if it happens again. You've seen Congruence's heart, and in some ways you know her better than she knows herself. She's an incredibly complex piece of software, and in many ways, a person. It's a strangely intimate feeling. Congruence is the reason you're still alive after a 20-year journey through space. You never knew what she's truly capable of. You also know that her most secret root access code. With this, you can make her do anything. You vow to only use this information for good. I'll continue playing with robots for a little bit longer. Still hitting new story here. You're set on location to update the firmware of the nano predators in the depot. How important they are for running a colony, they're quite simple from a robotics perspective. They don't really have any intelligence of their own, not like congruence, watering, and guarding bots. You install the update, run some routine diagnosis, clean out their filament nozzles, and declare them ready for service. Nami is camped out in the lounge, their holopad screen spread out before them like a drawing table. In another screen, there's a collection of photos of a manticore. Nami looks between the two screens, their brow furrowed in concentration, as they scribble directly onto the screen with a stylus. What are you doing? Well, Nami replies slightly, I wanted to write and illustrate a story about aliens, like in Turbo Girl Hyperjet Transform, except using the Xenos here on Vertuma, like manticores and faceless and stuff, but they can talk and instead of attacking Kali, they help people instead. That sounds cool, faceless would never help people. That sounds cool, let's just support that. Thanks, Nami chirps, scribbling happily at the drawing. They had the idea from the second Turbo Girl Hyperjet OVA. You know, the one where the Medusa demons show up and the aliens and the Turbo Girls have to band together and defeat the common enemy. I remember that part. I have no idea what you're talking about. I'm going to assume by now Nami has convinced us to watch the show. So I remember that part. Nami looks up at you with a start. Oh, thanks, Sam. 
that reminds me, so I'm trying to brush up on my Xeno Academy, or Autonomy, and I'm totally fine with writing, but... They blow out a big breath, ruffling their bangs. I kind of haven't been here long enough to make sure it feels right, you know. To make it go pop. And I want to make sure I'm being, you know, sensitive about stuff I don't know a lot about. So I was wondering, can you help me with some of the world building? Love to. Spend an enjoyable afternoon helping Nami with their story. When you're done, they give you a big hub and thank you for your help. You feel really proud of what you've accomplished. Dad, you're dying again, right? Your dad brightens when he sees you. Why, if it isn't my favorite gooseberry, he wheezes. I'm glad you're not as messed up as your old man. The pollen is no joke. Working in robotics lab is usually peaceful. An active box make for poor potential powers. Each shift you work usually passes by without much fanfare. This is not the case today. You enter the lab to find everything in absolute chaos. All the robots, vacuum bots, garden bots, even the turrets are all going haywire at once. Gerd's face flickers on her hollow screen. So Lane, she says in her right fade with static. I'm glad you're here. When Rob docked for repairs this morning, it uploaded a virus onto the botnet. As she speaks, you watch a rogue rocky bat and garden bot attempt to destroy each other and glide short south. The bots are rejecting their programming and gaining sentience. Well, this sounds like something somewhat important. I've quarantined it uh, to just the bots in this room, she continues, but it's propagating between the bots faster than I can fix it. I'm trying to avoid resorting to destroying the affected bots. Your stomach turns over. Pricking all these bots would be a massive blow to the colony. It would take months to get everything functioning again, even if you could. I can't access Rob, Congress explains. If there's a physical fault blocking communication, fixing that may slow the virus enough for antiviral processes to catch up. You get out your... Get up to your elbows and Rob's robotic guts. Just when you think you've got a handle on what might be wrong with it, it flickers to life. No, disassemble, it says. I want to live. You're shocked. You get the sense that the robot is watching you? Trying to figure out what you're going to do to it. You don't even know these things had speakers, let alone voices. It's unsettling. The guards grasp. It's thinking for itself? The bot's sensors flicker and go dark, then light up again. My name is Rob, it says in a more natural voice, then repeats, I want to live. Uh, yeah, we named Rob last time. No wonder Rob didn't want to reconnect to the network. Uh, Congruence's mature intelligence would have sought out and destroyed its nascent one. You promise that it, you won't force it to reconnect as long as it promises not to act out again by infecting the other ro uh, bots with dangerous ideas of self-determination. With the bot's consent, you tinker with its programming to unlock its ability to learn new things, so it can extend its original functions with new modules of its own. It can be whatever kind of bot it wants to be now. Ooh, pet bot. Rob seems eager to learn more about the colony. This time with its own eyes, well, sensors. Ask you asks to follow you around so it can learn more about how you live as a sentient being. Yay, robot friend. You're woken by the buzzing of a hollow palm. It's a colony-wide alert. You rub your eyes and ponder the thickness of the air seeping into your bedroom through the open veranda door. It's an ominous but beautiful sight. The seasonal pale pink haze has turned to deep fuchsia, with its scintillizing silver sparkles floating in. The shimmer. You check your Halopon messages. There's a colony-wide notice telling you to stay put. I could stay put. Head to Geoponics. Head to Medbay. I have the biology to help in Medbay. And we have... A father who's probably in geoponics, not wearing his face mask. Let's go to geoponics. Worst case, the assumption's wrong. But let's see if dad's being stupid. You don't your environmental mask and make your way out to geoponics where your dad's working. The air is so thick it's hard to see anything at all, and your footsteps are strangely muffled. Other people moving through the fog appear like spirits, flickering shadows through the murky sunlight. No one speaks except to urge you back to your quarters. You make it into one of the greenhouses, but you can't find your dad anywhere. You keep checking your howl pound, but he won't respond to your messages. You start to panic. Damn it, dad is in the med bay. <laughs> then you get a message from the doctor to tell you you come to med bay. Your father's collapsed outside the wall in his bad shape. Wait, outside the wall? When they finally let you see him, your dad is in medbay, asleep, 
He's almost unrecognizable. Uh, the shimmer is all over his skin, glittery and strangely lumpy, like something's growing out of him. Something is growing out of him. You realize he's seen since carefully scrape off what looks like fungus from his shoulder. She places it in a petri and hands it to hand it. There are tiny fungal growths all over him, even one poking out from the corner's mouth. You watch it with disgust as your th as thin trickle of glittering pink dust leaks off the top of it and disperses the air. Ah. Uh. I was hedging my bets. I was right to worry about dad. Figured if it went to the med bay, someone else could help. Damn it, dad. Be all right. Tange placed a sample from your dad under an analyzer and turns it on. He looks tired. I'm sorry, Selene, she mumbles. We're so close, or we were close. Sit with him for a while until Dr. Instant sends you back to his quarters to rest. In the early hours of the morning, you hear that your dad has passed. If I had gone to the med bay, I wonder if I could have stopped this, but I don't know if I could have. <laughs> you spend most of the next month in your quarters. They hold a funeral for your father. You're becoming an old hand at these funerals. Uncle Tannen, Combe, everyone else who died in the attack. Feels like your own mother's funeral was only weeks ago. It's colossally unfair. No one quite knows what to say to you, though they grieve along with you. It doesn't make it any easier. Aunt Anne and the others, and all the other adults of the colony will always be here for you, but... You guess you're an orphan now. You miss your dad. You miss your mom, too. Mostly, you just sleep. One morning, Chief Engineer Instance asks you to visit her in the med bay. You go, because you don't have the energy to say no. You're going to tell me you have a breakthrough through the whole pollen stuff two weeks late, aren't you? <laughs> I have to tell you something delicate about your father's condition, Selene. She begins folding her hands on her desk. I hope this information will give you some comfort. After your father's death, we continued to research the Shimmer, she continues, her voice even in neutral. Being able to study the disease in its terminal phase and beyond was the missing piece. We know how to prevent the Shimmer from taking hold in human cells, she says, her faint smile not quite reaching her eyes. With cultures grown from your father's cell lineage, everyone in the colony can be inoculated against the Shimmer. Thanks to your father, we have a cure. All right, we can be happy that our dad's death is going to be useful. It's okay to feel that way, and since tells you with an uncharacteristic kindness that you find comforting. Grief is different for everyone. If you need more time off to rest, nobody will mind. We can probably handle getting on with our life for a little bit. At least we have a robot friend still. Tangent looks about ready to collapse. I'm sorry about your dad, she mumbles. We tried so hard. So hard, she repeats herself, as if you're not even there. Cal gives you a watery smile. Hey, he says quietly. I could really use one of your dad's hugs right now, you know. Tammy hugs you tightly. Oh, Selene, she says. I'm so sorry. If there's anything I can do... I remember when my dad died, she continues softly. It it was awful, but it's okay. You're going to be okay. Nami f fishes something out of their jacket and hands it to you, a rumpled white origami crane. Um, so sorry about your dad, they stumble. He uh, seemed like a pretty cool guy. Mars breezes over and gives you a kiss on each cheek. I'm so sorry about your dad, she says, holding you at arm's length. If I can do anything, please don't hesitate to ask, she continues. I'll move heaven and earth for you, darling. Well, figuratively, you know. Rex's ears droop in sadness. Listen, I'm sorry about your dad, he says. He seemed like a really great guy. This shifts uncomfortably from foot to foot. I'm sorry about your dad, he mutters. He looks out towards the wilderness. The pollen's really thick in the Valley of Vertigo, too, he adds. 
Sometimes people on expeditions would get kind of weird about it. Guess they're not going to happen anymore now that they figured out the shimmer. And Amane nods it at you as you approach. Sorry about your dad, she says with a sympathetic but slightly distant smile. He was cool. Ace nods at you in understanding. Sorry about your dad, he says. He seemed like a really good guy. He really lucked out. Report for your first shift as Dr. Instance's nursing assistant. Instance was never supposed to be the literal doctor for everyone in the colony. All the colony's medical needs were supposed to be covered by the med beds, and then eventually with trained medical professionals from your generation. With the growing number of wounded and sick, it's pulling Instance's attention away from her actual work in the lab, hence why she needs the help. Well, maybe should have done this one first and learned that we have no trained medical professionals in our colony. I'm a doctor, not a physician, Instance grumbles as she swipes through Hollow Pound and give you access to the medbay systems. I can study the local xenophobia so it stops killing us, or I can treat burns and upset tummies. I can't do both. There, she says at the haptics in your Hollow Pound pulse. You should have access. Now don't bother me for anything less than a cranial bleed. It's a med bed, not a jar of leeches. Just follow the instructions and push right the buttons. You need something? Ask Congurance. Congurance beams at you in Hollow Can you handle that? Can handle anything. That's the spirit, Congurance Trips. It's you and me, Celine. High five. You gently bonk Congurance's panel with your open palm. And she laughs. There are no patients today, so you're going to brush up on your first aid training. Every colonist gets first aid training starting in their early teens. Lungs got to breathe. Hearts got to beat. Blood should stay inside the body. Check. You run through quiz scenarios with Congurance for a whole week. CPR, elevate and put pressure on wounds, wrap blood and bones, flush eyes with water, leave foreign objects in, and be real careful with in neck injuries. Fun fact, Congurance informs you. In the field, your hollow palm can just charge its batteries all at once as a makeshift defibrillator. First aid is important, but the goal is just to get the person stable enough to bring them here, to a med bed. That's where your, you and Dr. Instance will take over. You'll be fine. It might only be a matter of life or death. No biggie. It's Vertimalia. In the midst of the colony decorating and setting out the food of the fest, you have trouble finding your festive spirits. Your dad's only been dead for a few weeks. How could anyone else celebrate uh, at a time like this? You gather in the colony square for the usual speeches. Loom takes the stage to Fanfare Plus. Hello, people of Vertumia, he exclaims over the din. Happy Vertumia. He raises his hand to call for silence. Before we celebrate, I want to recognize those we lost this year. Head of Geoponics, Geranium, and Cervelia and Buragulo. I don't recognize that name. <laughs> the crowd goes silent for a moment. Your vision blurs with tears, and how's this supposed to make you feel better now that he's gone? This year has taught us that the aliens are more dangerous than we ever knew, Loom continues. It's not just the attacks during the glow, they're weaponizing the very air we breathe. But they won't win. Already we've discovered how to beat them at their own game. With everyone inoculated against the Shimmer, we're one step closer to total domination over this planet. After the console members each give their annual reports, everyone starts clearing the square and set up for their Tonyo games. You feel the pulse of the Hala message in your palm and open it up to read. Happy for Tonyo, there's a present for you on the table. XOXO, your secret admirer. You rush over to the feast table and spot a wrapped present among your roasted vegetables. Wow, you have a secret admirer. You unwrap your present. It's a data band? You snap it on your wrist and boot up your halpon. It's full of all your favorite songs, videos, shows, and games. It's a collection curated by someone who would really know you. Now, you'll always have your media with you, even if the net goes down, including all your favorite episodes of Rise and Fall of Sanctuary Moon. Nice. <laughs> You search the hollow palm for any hint as to who could have made it, but you can't find anything. You have to ask around, but later, the games are about to begin. So the secret admirer is either Tangent, who would make the most sense, or Nomi Nomi, because they're the only two that would make sense to actually pack favorite shows in there, such a thing. <laughs> you assemble with the other kids for the annual games. What do you choose this year? I could actually do the bake off. But alas, hey. We must continue the tradition of making Tangent second place for every year of her life. 
We're not going to have any pop culture questions this year, right? Tangent sulks, her voice dripping with disdain. I just don't see the point. Why aren't we celebrating real intelligence? Luckily, Nami doesn't overhear this. Or if they do, they don't care. They're just happy to be here. All those hours spent watching Holovids really paid off. You nailed the pop culture questions and about half the science and humanities ones as well. Nami and Tangent are too specialized to beat you, you trivia star. After the festivities, everyone descends on the feast. You heap up your plate with more food than you think you can, than you can eat in three sittings. Everyone around you is happy, but you can't help but notice the empty space where your dad should be sitting. It's your first holiday as an orphan. The other colonists try to make room for you in their conversations, but it's not the same. Tangent is hard at work in the lab, entering calculations or hollow upon and following over sa samples. She barely notices you enter. Hello, Selene, she says distractedly before going back to her work. Someone gave you a data band. It might have been Tangent. Tangent continues to scrutinize her work, though the tips of her ears go pink. What? No, uh, of course not, she says. I would never. The whole idea, I'm simply too busy to... That's okay, I won't tell. Tanj nods, finally meeting your eye. Good, she says. I don't want to make a big deal about it. Going for the smooch or let the moment pass? Hmm. Officially go after Tangent or not? Sure. Why not? We'll see how it goes. Nope. You lean in for a kiss, but Tangent takes a step back. I have to get back to work, she says, and leaves for the room. <laughs> injuries are common in geoponics. Mostly all the manner of pulled muscles and stress injuries, not to mention the occasional animal bite. You treat the farmers and ranchers for their minor medical needs, patching them up and sending them out again to keep working. You browse in the colony bulletin board on your holopom of Rexus, and you notice a new post from uh, Nami. It seems to be a short story. The title is Xenos to the Rescue. Ooh, boy. You open the story and read it through. Wow, it's actually pretty good. Nami did a great job of grounding the unrealistic premise and talking manacores with relatable characters and a strong emotional story. With your help on some of the finer details, Nami's written something that truly elevates the art form. You get the notification through your hollow palm that you've been, received some kudos, along with a message for Nami. Thanks for the help, Selene. Here are your royalties. Play in med bay again. Anamone comes in with training injury, a gouge that runs from her knee to her ankle. She hobbles in with a big smile. This one's gonna be kick ass, she crows as you help her get in the med bay. The med bays are miraculous technology, combined with genetic modifications to make your body. They can cure diseases and make your cells regenerate quickly, repairing even the most mangled limbs. If it's still attached to your body, the med bay can heal it. For Anamane, though, her genetic mutation means that instead of regenerating smooth new skin, she gets rough blue scales instead, much stronger than human skin. Anamane flicks the dials on the control panel and fiddles to the angle of the lamp overhead. Seriously, this thing is more comfortable than my bed. It's worth more than the whole ship, too, instant snaps, so don't break it. Nami puts her hand with an awkward go. Connect to the med bay with your hollow home and see the interface and diagnosis there. It's a confusing mess of readouts and buttons. The user's manual is ridiculously obtuse. You ask instance for help, but she just scoffs. I don't have time or the temperament to walk you through it. I learned how to use it myself, so you can just... Just don't break it. Press the right buttons. It's really very intuitive. You just have... If you have half a brain for it, you figure out the machine with zero problems. The sun lap turns out and the monitor says, please lie still for two hours. Nomadi groans. It's going to take forever, she complains. Stay with me for a while. I end up staying the whole time, keeping out of my comp company. Hmm. And it has something to say. You find Tanj puzzling over a large hollow screen, making notes on her hollow eye and frowning over them. As you approach, she gestures to wipe the hollow screen clean and start again. Ugh, she sighs, taking a break to rub her temples. Okay, Tanj, come on, think. You come up beside her and she startles. Oh, Selene, hello, she says. I'm a little running simulations on genetic diversity over the next few generations. You're welcome to see. It'll affect all of us, most likely. 
Tange pulls up the next genogram simulation. A family tree encompassing all the people in the colony. The familial relationships and genetic conditions. She scrutinizes it with a frown. We have an unusually high amount of hereditary heart disease. No matter how you slice it, she mutters. Luck of the draw. We lost quite a bit more genetic diversity than the original genesis of the Virtuma project anticipated. And that's not even counting those unwilling or unable to reproduce. She crosses his arm, her arms. It's possible to steer the ship out of it, so to speak. We'll take some purposeful breeding choices, at least for five to six generations. Tange gives you a curt smile and angles the hollow screen towards you. It sounds crude, she admits, but the colony will need to accept a certain level of oversight in this matter if we tend to survive, genetically speaking. Artificial insemination of material from Earth donors, even in love matches, for example. You stare at the genogram until your eyes cross and shake your head. Uh, Tange laughs. It's terrifyingly complex, isn't it? She says. I imagine this process happens to all the time naturally. Why, any sweating beast can squirt a little child into the dirt. It's all just proteins and luck. But the end result is this. She waves her hand over the massive charts. It's beautiful in a way. On a long enough time scale, we predict the genetic drift of the species. In the face of that, what do family bonds matter? Uh, Tange laughs bitterly. It's not if us sharing genes with someone guarantees you'll be a strong family unit. Does anyone really like their parents? Tell Tans that you miss both your parents, and that you'd give anything to have them back. Tans looks away from purses or sorry, she mutters. Being an orphan sucks. I kind of had longer to deal with it. As for my own family, Tans continues, I feel no allegiance to any of them based on blood. I have no family at all. That would be if I have no family at all, that would be acceptable. What about your brother? Ugh, Tans says. I'm ashamed we're even related. Literally all he does is go out in expeditions to talk to trees. Who even knows where he is right now? Don't you miss your mother? You mean the depressed drunk who died when I was a kid? A tangent retorts. No, not at all. If it wasn't for Chief Steward Anne, I probably wouldn't even still be alive. Do you want kids someday? Tanj looks thoughtfully at the genogram. Truthfully, I'm not entirely certain I can bear children. There must be limits to my gene engineer body. I certainly didn't experience puberty the set that Mars and Tammy did, for example. Besides, Tanj continues, children will only distract me from my work. The chief engineer never had children, after all. I think that's admirable. Tanj's gaze flicks over to where Chief Engineer's instance is talking to one of the other lab assistants. In some ways, I'm the child she never had, and she's the mother I wished I did have. We became close when we started my gender of affirmation process, she continues. It was so obvious then that we were kindred spirits. As I'd come in for checkups and observation, we'd talk about the science behind the process. Of course I showed an interest in it, and this has fostered that in me. She supported me. Tanj looks down at the ground, unlike my own mother, who by that point had ceased to find joy in almost anything. What would I be without instance, Tanj says. The only thing I have in my life is what she gave me. Not this bot not just this body, but my passion, my hard work, my achievements. Without her, I'd have nothing. I owe her everything. Just be supportive. Tan smiles. She is, she replies, more than anyone. Now if you excuse me, she says, turning back to the genotype board. I have our legacy to plan. Could continue working on the Bed Bay, but since we know something still might be up with Congruence and Glow is coming, we're going to keep watching on Congruence a little bit. When he's not on Expedition, Dis sometimes hangs out in the robotics lab with you. He's always felt a bit more of a kinship with the bots, you guess. No squishy feelings or compact social interactions. They just do what they're programmed to do. You've watched a strange friendship blossom between him and Nami Nami, like a crow and a hummingbird. They bond over their mutual love of both robotics and xenofauna. It's kind of cute that the two weird nerds from each ship found each other, despite their clear personality differences. Nami is working today and has asked Dis to test a new prototype for what they describe as the next generation of functional, fashionable exploration wearables. It looks like a robotic exoskeleton used by the construction crew, but dialed up to comic proportions with the cool missile launchers and jetpacks. I saw an anime, they say, strapping Dis into his suit. It's super going to work, okay? Take a few steps. Dis looks at you with a panicked expression. He takes a few faltering steps, immediately straining the balance servos. The whole rig squeals as he lifts off balance and tries to regain it, but he's caught in a positive feedback loop of balance recalibration that only makes it worse. Dis has mechan mechanically augmented limbs swing around wildly, knocking over a rack of bots and sweeping tools to the floor. You and Nami scream and die for cover. Not like this, Nami exclaims. Dis, turn it off! You turn it off, Dis yells back. I'm stuck in this thing! Nami pulls up the controls of the suit on their hollow palm and activates the kill switch. Mid-rampage, Dis crumples to the ground in a heap of 
plasteel limbs. You extract them from the wreckage. Nami is just draw, but Jiz just smiles and pats them on the shoulder. It's okay, Nami. It's this is why I never try very hard, especially when other people might see. You should try anyway. Trying is good. <laughs> Learning new things is fun, and getting better at stuff may is fun. You tell Nami that they'll learn more from their mistakes than from their successes. It has to be something I'm good at, though, Nami replies. Everyone else is super good at something. I can't wait to find my thing. You direct them to work on safer things, like cleaning up the lab. Dis and Nami work well together. You can't help but listen to their easy banter as they work. Nami could charm a smile out of a rock, but it's still surprising how well Diz responds to them. Like, even he doesn't quite understand their inexplicable pull Nami exerts from them. One last check on concurrence. You work with concurrence on tweaking her environmental monitoring process. Together, you manage to get her efficiency up by 0.005%. It doesn't seem like much, but concurrence assures you that even small changes add up over the course of centuries. You have small, extensional free crop reserves. Concurrence was active before you were born, and will still be serving your great, great, great grandchildren hundreds of years from now. You wake up to the soothing sound of your dad's voice, then remember he's still gone. You wonder how long it'll be before you spe stop expecting him to be there. You're lying in bed. Starting, staring at the wormhole through your window when you hear a deep thump resonate through the ground, and then a second one, quieter. The woven roof of your room quivers, unleashing a season's worth of fine glowing dust to sift through the air. Through your open window, you hear voices sounding the alarm. The annual offensive is here, and leading the charge are two massive faceless. Right inside, join the fray. Like usual, let's be stupid. Oh, these ones! You grab a plaz rifle and report to the front, where the line of soldiers has taken up arms and is waiting for orders. The colony prepares to defend itself against the two building scale phrases, as well as teeming swarm of smaller xenos that seethe towards you. Oh, joining is always stupid. We're not combat trained at all. <laughs> We're the nerd that goes to class all the time. Hold steady, order siege security rat. Keep the line! We're also at 100 stress, so if we can't do the card game well, we can't succeed. No, General Blue Brown's running from the front line gates, uh, front of the defensive line. He elbows right out of the way, waves his armor. Bring them closer! Draw them in! Rhett stops and stops from shoving them back, but just barely you can tell. Are you serious, he roars? We can't let them any further into the colony! We're going to fight them in our territory, Loom cries, raising his plasma right over his head. We have the walls, let's use them. We'll let them come inside and pick them off one by one. We can't pick off a faceless, Ruth sputters from the sidelines. Loom smiles menacingly, you can see the gleam of his teeth from here. I have a plan, he roars, just follow my lead. And with that, he turns and begins to run towards the approaching animals, roaring taunts and fire wildly into the prey to draw them close. At a loss, Rhett motions you all to fall back and let the animals approach. The area inside the gates becomes a swirling melee of smaller xenos and plasma fire, the two faces slowing slowly behind. In all the disorganization, you confused, you fire in the melee, screaming and retreating when some creatures get too close. You mostly just make things worse. Then an explosion goes off nearby, and you freeze in shock when all you hear is a high-pitched whine. Out of all the terror, you smell away from the battlefield, Lum comes from. Here they come! Here they come! He shouts joyfully and plows through the gates with the two faces gobbling behind. It's without doubt idiotic and horrendously dangerous. You can't help it. You hit record on your halopom and record the ensuing chaos. Catch a glimpse of the chief ret, putting his hand over his face and sighing. A squad of Helios soldiers take out the charge and helps shepherd the faceless into the open area in the middle of the colony. You have horrible flashbacks to the first time you saw faceless inside the walls. From the looks of the faceless on the other stratos, you're not the only one. Then you're all thrown to the gown by a tremendous explosion. Fire engulfs the center square, roasting the two faceless in an inferno that blasts the sweat from your pores. Rocks and chunks of dirt platter all around you with the occasional thunk of burning mushwood. The soldiers, the soldiers nearest the blaze all recoil in surprise. Clearly no one but Loom knew that the square had been rigged with explosives. You don't think anyone was caught in the blast, but it was close. Loom stands before the blaze, laughing and firing at the two tortured faces as they rose to death. You raise your hollow palm and capture the image, the silhouette dark against the column of the flame and smoke. 
It was ridiculously dangerous and stupid, but it lo does look pretty cool in your recorded footage. People filter out of their hiding places, shielding their faces from the heat coming off the bonfire in the middle of the square. On the horizon, the first watery rays of quiet sunrise str are struggling to make it a dent in the hot orange glare. The colony's fire suppression system is turned on the square, revealing the charred corpses of the two faceless. Utopia walks by with a reclamation came hauling an industrial glass cutter and a hover lift. Did he use the mining explosives, Utopia said in awe? Mighty bold of him, those things will blow a hole in a mountain. Or a creature, I suppose. She sighs. Wish he could have saved him from mining. That must have been the last of them. We sure can't make more. She then... Then she and her crew are out of earshot as they pick their way down and blast crater car of the faceless recycling. Fortunately... Fortunately, the colony was well defended. You and the other colonists have been fortifying the defenses, putting security above all else. Tonight's defense was still a resounding, if messy, success. But if Utop Utopia is right, you don't have any more of those explosives now. You can't just nanoprint unstable molecules like that. What are you going to do during the next attack? 